says here, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Notice that God calls your offspring your sons, and your daughters, as opposed to calling them your children. I believe that's spiritually significant, especially as I receive this message from the Lord. I'm really excited about it. I mean, I don't know if you woke up and come to church and thought, you know, what are we going to talk about today? Find out we're going to talk about sons and daughters. But every one of us either has sons and daughters or are a son or a daughter. I believe that this message is for every one of us. So I want to talk about sons and daughters. Whether you have sons and daughters or whether you are a son and daughter, this message is for all of us, and it will help us significantly. Um, my goal in this message is to enlighten you from the Word of God about parenting, particularly sons and daughters, and also how to relate to your parents as a son or a daughter. There are some important truths that I want to show you that you should know about having or being a son or a daughter. Amen? Amen. Now, sons and daughters fall into one of three different categories. Sons and daughters can be children that are age 0 to 12. <laughs> they also can be adolescents, which are our teenagers, 13 to 19. And then sons and daughters can also be adults ages 20 and over. Again, the emphasis is there's a difference between a child and a son and a daughter. Literally, the category of children ends at age 19. And then upon our 20th birthday and beyond, we're now no longer considered a child, but we're considered an adult. But what if you have a parent of an adult son or daughter who treats them like a child. Now we've got an issue. Or what if we've got a parent of a 0 to 12 year old and we treat them like an adult? And what if we have a parent of a 12 to 19 year old and we treat them like a child and not like a teenager? So there's some unique things that I've seen in the Word of God that I want to share with you Number one, you train children, that's 0 to 12. You teach teenagers, that's 12 to 19. And you advise adults, and that's from 20 and older. And my challenge today is to show you how to do this with love and respect at every level. Amen? So let's go ahead and just jump right into this. Uh, <clears throat> I want to talk about training children first. So go with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. The Bible essentially teaches us to train children. 
Now again, that stops once you become an adult. But specifically about children 0 to 12, that's the time that you have to train them. For example, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1 through 3, it says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Let me talk about that verse or that, that passage for a moment. There's three levels here, and I really believe they, they match all three levels of being a son and a daughter. First, he says children, 0 to 12, the emphasis for them in that age, they are to obey their parent. In other words, whether you understand it or not, you do what I say. And if you don't, then there's consequences and correction that follows. Why? Because the emphasis for a child is training, not teaching. Right. We'll emphasize the difference. Obviously, you teach your children, and the Bible talks about teaching your children. But I'm separating them because your children can go from zero to 19 years old. Well, you can't talk to a 19-year-old like they're a 9-year-old. You will lose the respect that you should have from that 19-year-old because you're treating them in the wrong way. So he says, children, obey your parents. Notice the second verse, there's an emphasis to honor your father and your mother. The goal for sons and daughters is really to have a, have a level of respect and love for your parents in a unique way. So really, the goal of a teenager is to really honor, to learn how to respect their mother and father. We'll talk about that a little bit. Now, notice the last part is that you are to do these things, these two things as children, so that it may be well with you and you'll live long as an adult. There are some adults that, that are in the body of Christ today that are struggling because of things that have happened to them as a child. There were things that they didn't learn, and there was some training and some disciplines that they didn't develop, and now as an adult, things aren't going well for them. Things aren't going well for them in their marriage. Things aren't going well with them where their children are concerned. Things aren't going well for them on the job because during these developmental years, things didn't happen the way that they should. They didn't learn how to honor the way that they should, and now they're struggling in life. Amen? Amen. One other ex exhortation is in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. And I want to really speak to the men for a moment because the world has the idea that the wife is left to raise the kids while the husband is off working and providing for the home. That is exactly backwards from, well, it's not backwards, but it's not right from what the Word of God said. The Bible says that you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, Amen. but bring them up in the training and in the admonition of the Lord. A couple things to note here. He says, fathers, directly, don't have an interaction with your children that causes them to turn in anger. That's right. And a lot of times, again, because of negative interactions with our parents, in particular our fathers, because our fathers weren't there to raise us and to interact with us, and now we've got anger problems that we don't realize are connected because dad didn't do his job. All right? So he really challenges fathers, and he's speaking specifically as it relates to children. Again, children are 19 and under. Okay? And he says, now you are to bring your 19 and unders, dads, up in the training and in the admonition of the Lord. In other words, from the word of God, you teach them, you train them, and you admonish them in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. So I challenge you, you know, uh, uh, fathers, be a good father yeah. to your sons and daughters. Yeah. Be involved in their training. Yeah. Be involved with their discipline. Yeah. Be involved with the correction. You know, we've got a 24-month-old and a five-month-old. Five-month-old, he's perfect, never needs to be corrected. <laughs> That 24-month-year-old has needed to be corrected many times, especially since about 15 months old. Yeah. Amen. Well, I, I've seen around our house, you know, my wife's getting after him, getting after him, getting after him, and I'm kind of doing my thing on the computer, you know, and I can feel from her the desire and the need for me to really get involved and be involved with his discipline yes. and his development. Right. 
Amen. Amen. And we have the same exhortation in the scripture. So again, the focus is to train children. Train. When you think, when you think about training, maybe the first thing that pops to your mind is like physical training or personal trainer. Or, you know, in school where you're training for an event or in athletics. I want you to notice in Proverbs 26, 22 and 6, and most of us could quote this, the Bible says to train, to do what? Train. Now, teaching is different than training. Right. And children are 0 to 12. Adolescents are 13 to 19. Where 0 to 12 is concerned, the Bible says train them in the way that they should go so that when they are old, they will not depart from them. Again, the focus here is here on training. Now, with training, there will always come correction if you're not doing it right. And with training, there will always come discipline. Meaning you're doing it wrong, and now here's a consequence of, that, of, 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 of now that you've done it wrong. Amen. So I want to talk about corporal punishment for a moment. Because not every family believes that a child should have a whooping if they, if they make a mistake. We call it a pow pow. When I grew up, we called it a beat. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. I grew up, my dad is a pastor to this day, he's having church. They'll watch this Facebook later on, so hey, dad. Amen. <laughs> but in Proverbs 23 and 13 and 14, the Bible says here about corporal punishment, it says, do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. <laughs> So, in my, with my brothers and I, we grew up, especially as we, uh, you know, were younger. My parents, you know, my mom would give us whoopings, but then if we got into a level of dis, uh, of disobedience that really exceeded my mom's tolerance, then she would tell us that, you know, when your dad gets home, he's gonna whoop you. Dad went out to the, the hardware store and bought a paddle, carved a handle into it, sat down and wrote scriptures on the board. He called it the rod of correction. <laughs> and Proverbs 23, 13, and 14 was one of the scriptures I remember seeing on the rod of correction. We feared those beasts. Now, obviously, in, in a day and age where children are, are, are abused and misused and mistreated, let me really set the, the order. Um, I believe that the, the, the buttocks was designed by God as the place to bring about correction. Yeah. I don't believe you should hit a kid in a tail. Yeah, I, I just, I don't. Um, I don't ever remember my mother or my father slapping me. But yet I've seen parents in parenting their children that, you know, they've reached out and slapped them, you know, just done different things. Uh, several, several, about, about a couple months ago, my, my 22, at the time he was about 22 months, he hit the five-month-old or the three-month-old with a cough in the head. And my first reaction was to hit him in his head. <laughs> I literally had to catch myself, you know, to, to do it the right, to bring correction the right way. Do I need to protect the, the, the young one? Yes, but there's a proper way that, that this is issued. So, so notice, this is God's idea about parenting. Dr. Seuss or Dr. Spot or whoever book you read that says that you don't want to whoop a kid from this age to that age, um, you might want to consider what the Word of God says. Amen. Amen. Because the scripture is very clear that if you beat him, he's not going to die. And you might, through that beating, be saving his soul from hell. Now, again, this is as it relates to children 0 to 12. So if you're not whooping your 0 to 12 year olds, you're really really missing them off. You're not doing it the way that God says, and they may end up having problems later in life. Let me give you one more. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24. Now again, I'm only giving you a couple of scriptures. That paddle was full of scriptures that talked about disciplining your kids. But in Proverbs 13, 24, it says, he who spares, you ever heard that? Spare the rod, spoil the child. But that's not what the scripture says. Watch this. Verse, verse 24 says, he who spares his rod hates his son. 
but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. So now notice, if you decide that no, I am not going to whoop my kids, I'm going to talk to them, I'm going to teach them, I'll discipline them or correct them in other ways, but I'm not going to spank them, 0 to 12, then you're sparing the rod. And the Bible says when you do that, really, because you don't see the end like God sees from the beginning, you are hating your child. Yeah. That's deep. So it is seriously important. I remember one day that uh, we were at a church and of all places, you know, to get in trouble. So we were kids, my brother and I particularly, we were 10 months and 29 days apart, and I have another brother who's seven years younger than us. So when we were, you know, 11, 10, that age, you know, he was three, and he was always perfect, no problem. But my brother and I, we'd be wrestling and praying, and we were at a church service, and we were wrestling and praying and getting into trouble, and my mom was trying to get us, and my dad, you know, he was probably focused on the message or whatever. I don't know what happened. I remember the tent meeting that we were at, and I remember leaving that tent meeting, driving down I-75 in Detroit, Michigan, on the southbound lane, and mama said, stop the car. They were arguing in the front seat, and she was getting on him about not disciplining us. She didn't like how he was disciplined, or that he wasn't. And she got out the car and left. We were like, um, are we going to get a spank? <laughs> and my dad is real calm and cool. And, I mean, my mom is like, ah, stop, right? Dad is like, okay, I'm going to throw you one. You know, real calm. He got in the, he was in the car and he's taking off. He, I don't even know how mama got home that day. <laughs> so we're like, are we in trouble? And he was like, yes. Are we gonna get a beat? He said, yes. Are we gonna die? He said, just about. <laughs> At family gatherings, we can laugh about that to this day. My brother, he remembers it. I remember it. I remember my dad and my mom got out the car. He was walking around, picked up a piece of lead near, near somewhere on the ground. And that block of lead, I remember it to this day. I mean, he didn't, obviously, he whooped us with, but I just remember that he, he picked that up and he put it in the car and took it home and everything. I'm like, wow. Never forget that. <laughs> Let me give you one more on this before we go into the next. It's important to... Correct and discipline your children 0 to 12. It's different when they go through 12 to 19, so let's get ready to talk about that. But notice this, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 5, the scripture says this. It says, as you have, uh, for, have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, watch this, he chastens Amen. and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Watch this. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? He goes on, but with but you are without but if you are without chastening, which all of you, which all of you have then become partakers. Then you are illegitimate and not sons. In other words, if you don't chasten or whoop or spank your, son, your children, then you essentially are not loving them. They are like bastards and then illegitimate sons as a result. But if you love them, then you will. Again, if you take up issue with me, look at the scriptures and then settle with your heart what you should do for your family, but I'm showing you from the word of God that from zero to 12, the Bible teaches you to train your children. Amen? Amen. That means to discipline them and to correct them. But things change once they go into their 12-year-old or their 13 to 19-year-old, and let's talk about that. <clears throat> you should teach your teenagers. Like you train your children, you should teach your teenagers. Where do you get this from? Well, in Luke chapter 2, verse 42, the Bible says that when Jesus was 12 years old, somebody say 12 years old. When Jesus was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And y'all know the story. His family left him behind unknowingly, and it took him a day to get back. 
Three days later, they finally found, they finally find Jesus. In verse 46, it says this. So it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers. Sitting where? In the midst of teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. I believe that's biblically significant because in a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, up to 19-year-old's mind, they are learning about life differently than they did from 0 to 12 as a child. Now they really want to know, why do I have to do this? Whereas before, I said it was hot. That means it's hot. Don't touch it. And if you touch it, there's, there's some trouble that comes. But now... It's why do I not? Well, it's going to burn you. The reason why you don't run into the parking lot is because you can be hit. You know, we, 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 we teach them so that they can understand and we allow them to be able to ask questions. Yes. How you engage your, your 13 to 19 year olds make the difference of it being well with them in the end because of the issue of respect. For example, the other week I was telling a story about how I came home from school one day. I vividly remember this also. I probably was 15 or 16. And I came in and my mom was standing at the kitchen preparing for the for the meal for the day. And I stood, stood there and talked to her. I said, you know, mom, I want to have sex. Everybody else is having sex. Why can't I have sex? And for the next 15 or 20 minutes, I went on and on and on. Like, why can't I have sex? Or, you know, everybody, did you have sex? And before you were married, and did dad have sex? And by the time my dad got home, she was like, Stan, Stanley, get your son. <laughs> and we had to talk about it. Well, the reason I, re I remember that is to encourage you. You want your children to be able to talk to you about anything. Yes. Yes. To this day, as an adult son uh, of my parents, I feel comfortable talking to them about anything. Why? Because of how they managed in parenting. Not to say that they were perfect, but for some reason, we feel comfortable with our parents being able to share. And that's so important because you are not always around your children, and the older they get, the less supervision they have. Come on, your 0 to 11-year-olds, they if they're not with your care, they're in somebody else's care. And come on, they, you know, they can't just run out and go along and go around the back of this building over here. Come on. They're under somebody's immediate watch, but now at 12 and 15 and 19, you drop them off. They're supposed to be over here, but they're over there. I can remember we went and hung out at my, my, my grandmother's farm, and my brother, we made our own weed. <laughs> and later on in life, we told our parents about the story, but we took newspaper and, you know, made it a certain size. We out there in the country, and, you know, weeds grow up in the fields. All we knew is, you know, smoke weed. So, hey, you know, we, we grab a stalk of weed and strip all the the, the things on the we put it inside that thing. Got hold of somebody's mattress and we in the back of the bar. You know, 12, you know, 12, 13 years old, mom and dad didn't know. My first recollection of drinking alcohol, 12, 13, 14 years old, eighth grade, whatever that age is. The teacher took us down to Toledo. Now, Mom, if you didn't know this, please forgive me. <laughs> we're on a school trip in our Japanese class. We're supposed to be hanging out. I went to the corner store, paid somebody outside the store to go in and buy a thing of Mad Dog 2020. Great. I'm telling you, I remember the store. Eighth grade. Preacher's kid. <laughs> You'll be amazed what your children understand. The scripture says in Luke 2, 47, that all who heard Jesus were astonished at his understanding. Yeah, you think that he's Mr. Good and, and she's just oh so great, but behind the scenes, they've got things going on. You want to talk to them about the birds and the bees, and they realize it ain't birds and bees. <laughs> It's not male. They'll know more and have more, you know, language of today in their heart and mind than you would imagine. What is so important is that you engage them in a way so that they will honor you. Again, children obey. Zero to twelve. 
But teenagers need to be at a place where they honor mom and dad and respect that mom and dad said no drinking, no alcohol, no listening to worldly music, and now I know why. And so even though I want to do it, everybody else is doing, and, and they're, they, man, you can do it and nobody will find out, but because of the love I have for my father and the love I have for my mother as a teenager, I'm going to honor them behind the scene. Come on. Because of how they engage with me. They literally sit down and show me that if you, if you do this, that's going to open the door to death. And we have conversations about that. Something happens on television, and we, we, we take a moment and make it a teaching opportunity. Yes. That's why corporal punishment, 13 to 19, I could probably count on one hand, probably in my case, two hands, but <laughs> how many time, how many beatings I got beyond 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. I can start to count those on, on hand. Why? Because your interaction with a teenager has got to be different than it was with a child. With a child, you can look them and tell them no, and train them that I said no and no means no. But now as a teenager, we need to talk about this because if you keep making these kind of decisions, you're going to end up in a wrong way. You don't want to end up in a wrong way. Here's the point. People learn in two different ways. There's probably more, and we've got many educations that are part of this, educators that are part of this church. But people can learn by education, but people can also learn by experience. Either way, the process of learning is done through teaching. Yeah. Notice what the scripture says about teaching your children. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9, God is talking about all the things in which he has taught them. In the last part of that verse, he says, you're supposed to teach the things that I've taught you to your children and your what? Grandchildren. Grandchildren. So if you're here today and, and you don't have a 0 to 12 or 0 to 19, but you do have some grandchildren, this is important. You're to teach them. Amen? You're, to, you're supposed to do what? Teach them, and particularly for your teenagers. Deuteronomy 6 and 7 essentially says the same thing. He says, you shall teach them diligently to your children and talk about them when you sit in your house. Talk about them when you walk by the way and talk about them when you lay down. Talk about them when you rise up. The older your children get, the more you'll need to talk to them. And if you're talking to a 19-year-old like a 9-year-old, you are going to lose them. Your mouth is moving, but my ears aren't listening. You've lost me, right? Now, notice Jesus was sitting there listening and asking questions. Make it so that they are able to ask questions. Again, as I said, people learn in two different ways. Now, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. Is it okay if I give you all scriptures to go along with this lesson? Yeah. The word of God says that the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, including your sons and daughters, and apt to teach. So dads, if you don't feel like talking is your advantage, then you're going to have to train yourself to talk to, you, to your kids. Right? right? Apt to teach and to be patient. This applies to to parenting as well. Now, when you talk about apt to teach, one of the things that you'll need to know is that people learn differently. You know, one son may get it differently than the other son, and one daughter may understand differently than another, but you need to figure out how to engage them for the specific goal. The goal from 0 to 12 is for them to obey, but the goal from 12 to 19 is for them to honor, which is to respect. Amen? Now, I've been trying to get to this for like five minutes. The Bible says that you can learn things by experience as well as education. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 27, this is referring to Laban, but I want you to notice a part of what he says, which is so powerful. He says, and Laban said to him, please stay if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Say out loud, learn by experience. Is, is there anybody here that's ever learned anything by experience in this? Some of the best lessons that we've ever learned was when we bumped our head up against the wall. Come on, mom and dad told us that don't do that, and we did it, but then we really learned. Oh, come on, y'all talk. There's the school of hard knocks. Now, I would prefer, I would prefer to learn by education. For me, for actually, I would love to learn from your mistakes. 
But in reality, I learn very well when I, I'm a tactile learner. If I can physically do something rather than you just telling me, then I'm really going to learn that lesson. Understand this as it relates to your teenagers. Some need to learn by experience. I'm not saying let them hurt themselves. Sometimes I think some people do. I told you a lot. <laughs> Amen. But sometimes you can learn things well by experiencing. And then you can sit down after you experience it and talk about it. I mean, Jesus himself was innocent. Let me show you this. In Hebrews chapter 5, you all, our example is Jesus. It would be great to know that Jesus sat down and learned things from the teachers of the law and so forth. But there's also this scripture which says, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Though he was a son, Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he, what, suffered. In other words, Jesus learned some things by experience, Amen. by the things that he suffered. So in other words, when you're teaching your teenagers, they'll learn two ways. There will be some times when you can sit down and tell them, don't do this because this will cause that. Don't do that because this will open the door to this, and you don't want that, do you? But there's other times where you will need to, in a controlled or supervised environment, let them, in other words, bump their head. Oh. How about this? L allow them to suffer not being able to use the game station for a week because they Man. did something you told them not to do. Or allow them to not have the use of the cell phone because they, did, they didn't get the grades or hit the mark that you set out for them. Notice you can learn both ways. It's not just about the corporal punishment. It's not just sitting down and talking to them, but now they have to suffer working and doing extra or fixing something or doing something, right? You can engage them in a different way in order to connect with them. Amen? Amen. Now let's go on and let's talk about advising adults. Advising adults. I really want to, in, in this part, I really need to take it home because there are some parents of adult, not children, because once you become an adult, you're not a child. But some of us are treating our adult sons and daughters like children, yeah. where we're trying to teach them. But the time for teaching is over. Right. So, yeah. I love my mom, I love my dad, but I'm a grown man. Yeah. I'm a husband, I have children, yeah. right? And so now they're interact. Now they will always be my father and mother in the flesh. And there should be a, an honor that I bestow upon them for the rest of my life. But how they engage me and their opinion about how I raise my children and how I treat my wife and how I live my life and how I do my thing is an opinion. Right? And I'm going to show you from the word of God that God acknowledges the difference between a child and an adult. So read this carefully, and then we'll be done. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 14, I'm going to give you a few scriptures that show that there is something biblically significant about the age 20 and above. In, in Exodus 30 and 14, it says, Everyone included among those who are numbered, from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. This is an order from God to the children of Israel, and he points out that everybody who's 20 and older is supposed to give an offering to the Lord. And there must be something significant about 20 in the mind of God. Another verse of scripture is Numbers chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, from 20 years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. So notice there's something about a 20-year-old now, they're able to go to war, they're able to fight amongst other men. We now consider them as an adult, and you can number them and put them in that, that category to go. And then one last verse, you know, when the children of Israel were about to go into the land of promise, they sent out spies, and everybody under a certain age wasn't able to go, and those above... Notice this specifically in Numbers 14, 29. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall, uh, 
shall fall in this wilderness all who are, are, were numbered according to the entire number from 20 years old and what? And above. Do you see that there's something biblically significant about age 20? And something should change. You are no longer a child. Therefore, shouldn't be talked to like a child and shouldn't be treated like a child. Amen? Amen. So notice this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11, it's one of my favorite verses of Scripture, and we've used this in ministering to men. Verse 11 says, Paul says, that when I was a child, now again, according to our definition, that's 0 to 12, well, adolescence includes childhood, 0 to 19. When I was 0 to 19, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I did what? I put away childish things. There's a difference between a child and an adult. And our interaction then has to change. So we teach children, we, 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 we train children, we teach teenagers, but we must learn to advise adults. This will help us all so tremendously. In the book of Matthew, chapter 23, I hope this is not too many scriptures. I love the word of God, so I appreciate it. The Bible says, but do you, do not, Jesus says to, to the people that were listening, he says, do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all, what, brethren. So Jesus is talking to people, and he says, don't allow people to call you t t teacher. There's one teacher, that's Christ. But you are all brethren. So he's talking about people that believe in him. And we are all brothers. How many of y'all know we're all brothers and sisters in Christ? Yes. Amen. Well, in the next verse, he says we are all brothers. Verse 9, he says, do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father, he who is in heaven. This is, if you take this literally, that means don't call your natural father your father, your natural father your mother. Because you have a spiritual father. Your, your true father is in heaven. And that then, if God is my father, and God is my father's father, that literally makes us brothers. Come on, come on. Now we're in relationship because of the flesh. But spiritually, my mom and dad are literally my brother and my sister, according to the words of Jesus. Now think about then, how would you interact with your natural brother if he had some financial situation in his family that he was dealing with? Or what if he had some relational situation in, you know, in his marriage and you find out you're, you're the brother and you two brothers are talking? You're not going to talk to your brother like he's your child. Right. Got a couple rights over here. Can anybody help me over there? The way, the way you interact with your brother and your sister, you'd be like, you know, if I were you, I wouldn't talk, I, I wouldn't do this. I, if I were you, or have you considered doing this instead of that? Yeah. Come on, how many of y'all know when you interact with your brothers, you know, it's like, look, you know, I'll take your advice, but you're not my dad. Yeah. <laughs> you talk to your sister, well, you know, okay, well, that's your opinion, and opinions are like, but everybody have one. <laughs> you put what your brother and your sister says in a whole nother class. Why? Because the interaction is different. And Jesus, literally, I mean, there was a time Jesus was ministering one day and there was a big crowd. And, you know, he big time. Jesus done went global or viral, however you want to put it. Everybody's following after him and so forth and so on. And one day the room was so packed that his mother's and his, and his, his, his mother and his brothers couldn't get in. And he had sisters too. And they said, you know, Jesus, your mom's outside. And she said, she wants you to come out there. He literally said, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Except those that do the will of the Father. Yes, right. I love you, mom. <laughs> who is? Now, I believe with all my heart because Jesus was a man of honor. That he finished out his teaching. And it went out there to find out what he said, and we know he loves his mother. Yeah. I mean, from the cross, he yeah. speaks to John and he, he says, I need you to look out for my mom. Right. You know? Y'all take care of each other. Right? Right. So the love and the respect is there, yeah. 
But the relationship is different. His father is in heaven. And he admonishes all of us as brothers. Amen. And this is so uniquely significant in our lives as sons and daughters. In 2 Thessalonians, as I'm about to close, in verse number 14. The Bible says, and if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, know that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. And yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. This is so critical. And now Paul was writing to the church of Thessalonica, and he's saying, if there's anybody in the church that's not doing what I've written to you all about, then make a note of that person and don't don't fellowship too often with them. Now, don't treat them like an enemy. Yeah. But don't fellowship with them too often to make them feel like their lifestyle is okay. Yeah. Matter of fact, by you're not fellowshipping with them so often, they'll start to feel ashamed. You know, oh man, we're well, gonna hang out. Well, no, we we won't. We don't really need to hang out right now because you got some things that disagree with the way that God wants you to live your life. But you know, I'm not your father, so you can do what you want to do. But I just won't be able to hang with you right now based on what you got going on. He says, make a note of that person that's not obeying the word in the way that they should, so that they can feel like maybe I'm not doing this right. And then he says, don't treat them like an enemy, but admonish them, treat them, connect. Come on, y'all help me now. Engage with them like a brother or a sister. How would you do that? If you love your brother, you're not going to let them ride down a road where the bridge is out. Hey, 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 man, no, man, you're going the wrong way. You're not doing this thing right. Come on, man. You're going to encourage your life. I, 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 can't, I can't live your life for you. You know, you're not my child, but if I were you, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't say it that way. Come on, y'all. You should both say, my son. Now I use this because the Holy Spirit brought it up to me. You advise adults. Because we're all brothers. And the Bible tells us to admonish one another as brothers. So let's put this in context. If you've got somebody in your family, particularly if you're a son and daughter, a grown person, and you've got adult children, and they're not living their life according to the word, well, you're past the time of training them. You're beyond the time of being their teacher. Okay. In many cases, you don't want them to be experiencing hardships and not talk to you. But when they come to talk to you, if you're not listening, how can you win them? I know I'm ministering right now. Even as your adult children. Yeah, they think they, they, think they want to talk. I, I need my father and my mother in my life. Not to be a parent to me, but because of their love for me. I need their wisdom. They've been married 45 years, 50 years we've celebrated. I'm having a thing with my wife and I can't quite figure out what's the best option and I can run it by my dad. If he engages me right, if he treats me as a, as a child, I can say, all right, well, I will never bring that back up to you again. Right? If he tries to fix it for me, come on. But if he advises me as an adult, then he's won me forever. Amen? In my 60s, I can call him and say, hey, Dad, uh, got this thing going with the church. What do you think? And he can say, you know what? Well, What's up? What do you think we should do? I was thinking I should do it this way. Sounds good. I also might want to consider this. How many of y'all know that's a positive relationship? He can admonish me as a brother, and I can respect him and honor him as a father. Amen? It's a unique relationship. And so I close with this. Train your children. Discipline is proper. Now, you should discipline your children properly, not publicly. I've seen people, I've been out in public places, 
And I've seen people whoop their kids in front of, in the public. Um, you know, I told you I got a 24 month year old, he's 25 months, and he's almost 26 now, 26 months. And he gets in trouble sometimes. He gets pop pop just about every day. Uh, yeah, yeah. I popped him last night. Sit up there. Sit up there. He gets over it. But I'm, that, this is the time to train him. Right? Um, but one time, uh, Cohen was over. And Cohen is my youngest brother's youngest son. And so they are just like months apart. Not too many. It's like maybe 20 months apart, 14 months apart. And so they get along real good. Well, they get along. Amen. One day, my son did something he shouldn't have done. And I popped him. And the way he cried was differently because I popped him in front of Cole. And for the first time, I didn't know. This is my first time being a parent. But for the first time, I'm realizing he's actually embarrassed that he got in trouble in front of his, his cousin, right? When you train your children and teach your teenagers, do it with love and respect. If you rebuke them publicly in front of other people, even in front of their pastor, that's going to affect them. How would you like your boss to read you up one side and down another for what you messed up on your job? You would want them to do it publicly, and you would write them up. You would take it to the next level. You'd escalate it. Come on. If they read you in front of somebody else, that's just disrespectful. Well, if it's disrespectful for you, don't you think that it would be disrespectful? I'm the mama. Oh, okay. Well, you need to listen to this message again. <laughs> because you're, you're going to lose an opportunity with them in how you're handling it. So train your children. Teach your teens. Wow. Y'all get anything out of this? Amen. 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 Thank you all for being a part of being alive with us. We look to see you next time. God bless you.